Um, thanks, Jane, and thanks, Mark, for that very comprehensive uh, overview of where we are. There are two kinds of questions, really, we want to try and get to uh, in this session. The first is to understand what's the problem we're trying to solve here? And Mark has given us some really good statistics and some overall numbers. Some of the people who are malnourished are in countries we recognize as poor developing countries, Malawi. Some of them are in countries which we think of now as middle income countries and emerging powers, India, one of the largest malnutrition loads in the world. Quite a lot of them are in fragile states and war-torn places you know, think DRC, Somalia, the whole corn of Africa uh, uh, affected by drought. Different kinds of nutrition problems in different kinds of places requiring different kinds of interventions. It's useful to talk about jumbo jets. I always like to think of individual children in individual places and ask the question, how do we tackle uh, uh, their problems? And there's a lot of expertise in this room about that question. We'd like to hear some stories, I think, uh, later on. That's the first question. The second question is, you know, what's business got to do with this and how do we get business to do more? What's the market failure that we're trying to deal with? Uh, what kind of policy framework does business really need? What pieces of public policy are going to be needed and what investments are going to be needed by the state in order to transform the opportunity uh, into reality? We're going to deal with both of those questions in this panel. And um, we're going to finish at uh, 11 o'clock. We have three people from GAIN who know a lot about both those questions. And I'm going to ask them each to say something just for five minutes to kick us off, and then we'll have pl plenty of time to debate uh, among ourselves. Um, Greg Garrett, who's director who leads on large-scale food uh, uh, fortification, putting iodine into salt and many other examples I'm sure he'll talk about. Uh, Marty Van Lira, director who leads on nutritious food for mothers and children and Bonnie McClafferty, who leads on agriculture and nutrition, the new area that Mark discussed. I won't give them uh, as lavish CVs as Jane kindly gave me, but their details are in here, and you'll see they all have a lot of experience in this topic. Let's start at Mark at your end. Five minutes each, bang, bang, bang. Tell us what's the problem mm -hmm. we're trying to solve and why business matters and what's needed, and then we'll open it up for some interactive discussion and then come back to you for a bit more later on. Okay. Mark. Yeah. Thanks, uh, Simon. Um, I don't have to repeat the statistics that Mark already uh, mentioned, um, but basically we, we, we have identified that the first thousand days of life is where really a root cause of malnutrition is. And uh, when Mark mentioned that there is about 180 children um, in the world that are stunted, stunted as an indicator of chronic malnutrition, I thought, well, that is about more than 10 times the entire population of my home country, the Netherlands. And for me, what it means, basically, is stunting is just short for age, but uh, there's a lot behind it. It's actually um, insufficient development, both intellectually, um, and these will be children that cannot be as productive in life. Uh, they're not growing up to their full biological potential. So just imagine 10 of those, well, relatively tiny countries as the Netherlands, but not really being able to, um, to grow and develop economically. Because that's one other statistic that Mark didn't mention, I think, is that we, um, we see some um, evidence that these countries lose up to 3% of their GDP just due to malnutrition. Um, so the, the point is we basically also know what we have to do, at least for, for malnutrition in children under two years, we know what is so important for them. We know that exclusive breastfeeding up to six months of age is basically the only thing a child needs to be um, healthy um, growing. We also need that, know that breastfeeding needs to be continued after six months of age to protect the children um, against a lot of the, um, the infections. It gives them um, a better protection. And that as of six months of age, there's a need for adequate complementary feeding that is nutrient dense, energy dense, timely introduction, semi-solid, so not too liquid, etc., etc. We know all of that. And so it does, shouldn't be too difficult. Um, but there's two types of interventions, I would say, that are needed for that. And one is behavior change. And it's basically the most difficult thing in the world to do, changing human behavior. Um, um, we know it's for those that are addicted to smoking or for those that um, just love chocolate. We know how difficult it is to really practice the right um, behavior. Um, there are some... 
um, I would say, some projects that have shown impact on improving breastfeeding figures or improving, let's say, complementary feeding practices, um, but at scale, at a country level, we've not been able to really impact those indicators. The second thing is where GAIN is very much focusing on is, is improving the access to nutritious food. So the complementary foods that kids need after six months of age to grow um, optimally. And as GAIN, we've been focusing on the supply of the foods, we've been focusing on the quality, we've been focusing on quality control, distribution. We are working with small companies and we've got one of the CEOs of a Ghanaian company here in the room. Um, and we've seen what are the struggles to get the products in the market. And that is where, in, in, in my program, we've been looking at the supply of these products. But we've realized over the past couple of years, something that you as businesses all know, that there's no supply without demand. Um, and so this is a typical, pro I would say, public health approach, is we know what is needed. But how do we create the wants at the level of the consumers? How do we do that? How do we effectively change behavior um, of consumers. Public health tends to look at knowledge and, and drive and say from, from a scientific point of view, this is what we need to do. Um, but I think that businesses have another approach. We're looking at aspirations, we're thinking about emotions, and how can we tap into that? Um, the other point, I think, an, a real issue is basically in the policy environment. Um, Mark already mentioned the International Code of Marketing of Breast Milk Substitutes, which was actually meant to protect breastfeeding, because that's the only thing kids need between zero and six months of age. But now we see a trend where some countries are applying the same strict policies also to products, to the, the complementary foods beyond that age group of six months. Um, because they'd like to protect, again, the continued breastfeeding as well as the traditional diet, the traditional foods that are, are given to, um, to children um, from a point of view that dietary diversity should do the trick. Um, however, a lot of the traditional diets do not um, contain the nutrients and energy that the children need. So here we have a dilemma. We would like mothers to change the behavior and make sure that those diets are diverse. But on the other hand, by themselves, the diets are not like that. And we go again back to the behavior change, which is just um, an enormous challenge. Um, so for me, um, I think that um, the challenges as well as the opportunities lie not only looking at innovations in products, but definitely looking at the policy environment and see how can we um, learn from what happened in Kenya this year where a breast milk substitute um, bill has been enacted that is actually expanding to all types of foods that are marketed to children under two years. And it makes it incredibly difficult for businesses but also for gain um, to promote access to and, and better choice into the whole range of um, nutritious foods. Because one thing I really want to make clear is that these mothers do not have a choice. It's either the traditional diet, which lacks the nutrients or the energy, or it's very, very good, high quality, premium products, but they cannot afford them to, to really regularly give them to their children. So either they're given bought once a week or once a month, or they're diluted, um, et cetera. And in the middle, this whole area of, of products is where the market failed. Um, and, um, and basically, I, I would say maybe there was no market and we're trying to um, encourage that there is a market. And thanks, Marty. Just, just, uh, just, just to push you a little bit and to understand a little bit better, in this spectrum of children who are malnourished, from the child in the refugee camp whose parents have just been killed and whose house has been burned, through to the child in an urban area whose mother has been completely dislocated by moving from one culture to another. Where do you see the biggest burden and the biggest opportunity for business? Um, um, so if, if business talks about, let's say, um, the, con the um it's all types of consumers based on their income from the A consumers, the, the, the high level income, down to the E consumers. I think the refugee camps, it's those that just um, are the lowest, the poorest of the poor. That's not where the opportunity for business is, obviously. Um, but if we're looking at one third of the children in developing countries that is chronically malnourished, one third, one in three children, then definitely I would see the opportunity in the, um, 
in the C and the D consumers, maybe some of the B consumers, um, and very much in, um, in the urban or, urban or semi-urban um, areas. Okay. And that's where it is. I think we might come back to that question because I'm also a little bit anxious always that we have to be really careful not to blame the mothers for not looking after their children properly because often they are in very different, you know, life is changing for them very quickly and they need help yeah. at critical moments. Absolutely. And, and I, I, I totally agree with you and, I, and therefore I think it's so important to give mothers choices because public health nutritionists, and I know because I, I, I am one or I was one, um, tend to give a lot of advice, education to mothers, but it's extremely complex messages, there's a lot of things they have to take care of, and it's, it's very difficult for mothers to follow that advice. So how can we make it more easy okay. to them? Very good. Now, I thought we were moving from one end to the other, but obviously we're not, so who's going to go next? Participation. Go ahead. Okay, great, okay. you go next. <clears throat> Thank you. So maybe I'll give just a very brief overview of uh, food fortification and then talk about some of the impacts we've seen as well as some of the trends moving forward that were we're observing on our own programs, but also globally in the literature. Uh, fortification of staples and condiments has been around for about 80, 90 years at a significant level, starting in the U.S. and Switzerland, as most of us know, with salt iodization. Uh, in the U.S., in the 20s, it was very successful, as well as in Switzerland. Um, moving on into the 30s, we had the uh, fortification of dairy with uh, vitamin D. And then in the 40s, enrichment of flour and bread with uh, iron became quite widespread in the U.S. And, and these efforts, as well as some others, really led to the virtual eradication of a number of symptoms and diseases of micronutrient deficiencies in the West, uh, namely goiter, pellagra, rickets, and beriberi. And um, so it was very significant, very, uh, very successful. In, um, in Switzerland, interestingly, Napoleon in, in 1800 had commissioned a, a, a census which actually showed that uh, in some of the mountainous cantons like Valais, which is fairly close to where Geneva, where, where Gain is located, was showing rates of um, 10, 20 percent uh, cretinism as well as goiter. And it's really because of salt iodization that we saw those levels uh, fall, and it's been sustained because the Swiss program is very mature and able to adjust salt iodization levels to match consumption. So it's been very successful. We've seen a lot of impact in the West. Uh, in developing countries, there has been some significant impact as well. Mark had mentioned in his opening speech about the neural tube defect decrease that we saw in South Africa, in Latin America, and Southeast Asia, we've seen a lot of vitamin A deficiencies decrease because of effective fortification. Generally in Africa, it is more difficult, and, and I think this brings, brings us to the point of, you know, where are we going and what are the trends and, and, and what do we need to focus on going forward? And I think one issue is this quality assurance and compliance and really working both uh, on the external as well as the internal uh, level to make sure that uh, foods are adequately fortified. This, this means working with the regulatory agencies and countries to make sure that they can enforce if it's mandatory uh, effectively, but also to incentivize industry to fortify adequately and to ensure that the inputs around equipment and uh, premix are, are quality inputs and that the technological know-how is in place. Um, I think also going forward, processed foods is a very interesting um, um, phenomenon that's taking place. Uh, sodium, for example, in, in the UK here, 70% of a person's uh, sodium intake is from processed foods. It's not from table salt. So if we're not ensuring that the, the salt that is iodized is going to the food industry, what happens as countries urbanize and GDP grows and, and incomes grow and people are eating outside of the home more, they're not going to, get, going to get their iodine. So we're really working on closing the loopholes both on policy and practice to ensure that um, fortified products, iodized salt, fortified wheat, uh, vitamin A fortified oil that would be ingredients in, in um, different food products are actually being used and, and contributing to people's diets. So I think quality assurance and control, uh, paying attention to these trends around processed foods is very critical as we move forward and really just trying to scale up because we know it's an intervention that works. It's just getting those choke points correct and really working with, um, with industry effectively and government to, to, uh, to roll this out. Is the glass half full, half empty, a quarter full, three quarters full? Half full, yeah, definitely. I, I, I mean, there's a lot of positive momentum. There's governments around the world that are lining up for mandatory fortification, which I think levels the playing field. It might not always be the best way forward in, in some contexts, but in Africa, certainly it, it helps to, to, to incentivize industry to get involved if it's, if it's, if it's mandated and enforced. And, and, uh, but they need startup capital. They need technical uh, technological know-how, capacity building, and, and I think this is where GAIN and other agencies, as well as business, um, can really um, provide in-kind assistance and, and provide that startup capital and know-how that's needed to roll this out. 
Okay, we'll come back to that in a bit more detail. Thanks so much. Uh, Bonnie. Okay, thanks, Simon. Um, so both Mark and Jane mentioned in the beginning that nutrition has had unprecedented attention. Um, and one of the things we're seeing is not only is it working within public health, but it's bringing in other sectors. And agriculture is an enormous sector. I mean, one can't really compare nutrition to agriculture. One needs to compare agriculture to public health. Um, and the power that's behind agriculture, whether it be new technologies, policies, private <coughs> sector, it's an enormous ally for nutrition if we actually align our incentives properly. Um, so why did GAIN bring in agriculture? Um, well, that human existence requires that agriculture produce it's at least 50 nutrients in order to um, meet the metabolic needs of humans. And if the food systems don't meet those needs, then you've got the situation that we're in. Um, with you know, a chronic undernutrition, we've got mortality and morbidity rates increasing, and we've got worker productivity declines. Um, and today, many of the food systems in the developing world simply are not producing to meet the needs, the nutritional needs for, um, for their societies. Um, so GAIN was recognized that agriculture and its production all the way from um, the technologies that go into agriculture to marketing to distribution systems that they are this ally and that we can help reach some of the nutrition outcomes if we focus in on the production system itself. But another reason to think about agriculture isn't just as an engine to improve nutrition, but agriculture needs to do no harm. As Mark had mentioned, production is the key outcome for agriculture, more food. We need more food. Better food is not on the agenda. And we recognize that, in fact, agriculture is breeding nutrients out of food. Not on purpose. They're just not paying attention to it. Nutrition is not a core breeding objective for the new technologies. And we need to really pay attention to what's happening to the food system um, if nutrition is not on the agenda. We also know that a lot of the undernourished live and work in the agricultural sector, and I think GAIN has really been on the forefront of recognizing that a lot of food insecurity, a lot of undernutrition, actually does sit within the agriculture sector. Um, and it's, it's ironic, it's a sort of a cruel irony that you've got um, the producers who are also the undernourished, um, which, which is a, a, an interesting um, challenge that we face. Um, and I think finally, GAIN is recognizing that people do eat diets, not nutrients, and that the, diets, the system of the diet is something that we need to begin to work with. So where are we starting at GAIN to begin to work with agriculture? And, and I'm the new kid on the block here at GAIN, um, and I've actually, I, I'm delighted to actually be working with some of you within this first couple of years of, of being with GAIN. One of the great frameworks that agriculture offers is this value chain. Um, and so foods from production, uh, so from input to production to post-harvest to processing to packaging to transport all the way to consumption, that value chain will differ depending upon who you're hungry are. If it's the rural-based, you're eating seasonality is huge. Yes, you're using markets, but in a seasonal time, that's a huge challenge. But if you're eating on farm, you have a much shorter value chain than if you're providing foods through urban markets. And we need to look at all of those. Who are the poor? What are they eating? Where are they sourcing those foods? And where is, you know, agriculture sits at the very beginning. Um, so we had gained, what we need to recognize though, and I think Jane brought this up in the beginning, is unlike other nutrition interventions, agriculture as a nutrition intervention doesn't have the evidence base. The, uh, the fortified foods, the, food, the complementary foods for moms and kids, they've all had efficacy trials very clear scientific basis behind moving forward and investing in those interventions. So GAIN has a large piece of its ag program that we're building that is building the evidence base behind agricultural interventions um, to improve human nutrition. Um, so examples of that are we're looking along the entire rice value chain, we're looking at the opportunities for fertilizer, the addition of micronutrients into fertilizer, can that actually improve the nutritional density of the staple foods? We're looking at modifying the post-harvest processing practices for rice in particular in Bangladesh. Can we, can we modify the polishing practices to preserve micronutrients? Um, can we use the parboiling and soaking processes of rice to actually add fortificants? And this is where agriculture actually works across some of the initiatives that gain. Um, so let me see. So, so we're working on the evidence base. We're also working on actual investments themselves. And I, Mark alluded to, and we'll speak maybe a little bit more later, 
about the need to develop markets for nutritious foods. So at GAIN, we're developing what we're calling the Marketplace for Nutritious Food. It's an innovation engine in three target countries whereby we create a community of practice of enterprises, local enterprises that are trying to move nutritious foods to market. And we help catalyze them and bring them together as a community. Um, and I, I, I finally, you know, I think part of this was to say, where are we going to be in the future? And what are some of the trends we need to think about with agriculture? And Simon, you, you are a giant in this world, actually. I'm a, I'm a little bit, <laughs> I'm a little bit um, shy around this. But um, food price volatility, that's going to keep going. These are the ingredients to your foods. And I think we have to really, really keep an eye on the food price volatility. Um, climate change. Climate change is something we'll have to watch. That's going to affect your base ingredients. I was recently, a year, about nine months ago, I was in a meeting with the head, the head researcher at the International Maize and, Re Maize and Wheat Research Center. It's called CIMIT. And they developed all those Green Revolution rices, um, wheats and maize. And they are very, very nervous about wheat. Very nervous about wheat. You've got a four degree variation in the genetics of wheat. And then wheat starts to fail. And this comes to the third point, which is new modern agricultural technologies. And we've got to start thinking about using some of these new modern, to tackle some of these huge challenges that are going to be in the food system. Um, finally, I'm delighted, a year from now, you'll see your cousins in the agriculture sector here, if I have my way. Ah, Seed good. companies, fertilizer companies, I think they all need to be here. Will you just clarify for us, that, uh, uh, Bonnie, that agriculture is not the same as food? Uh, and so, uh, sometimes people get a very good income out of growing, you know, uh, uh, cocaine or cocoa or cannabis or, or coffee <laughs> or, cotton, or tea. Or cotton. <laughs> or cotton. <laughs> the C word, we'll stick with So cotton. that's kind of one aspect of this. And then the other is that actually sometimes you get a very good income out of growing food, but that food goes into biofuels. Right. This is a huge, and I think the price volatility is very much linked to the whole balance of food for fuel versus food for sustenance. Um, and that debate, that's a policy debate that is something that we, we have to increasingly become involved in. When people are converting food to fuel, um, it, it upsets the whole balance of food security. Fine. Well, look, we've got a spectrum of food and nutrition problems. We've agreed on that. Um, we can see that there are some real challenges to the food supply in the future associated with climate change, um, uh, with urbanization, um, and with changing livelihoods. Um, and we have a set of options here, which are around fortification, um, around better education and better foods for mothers and children, and about agriculture which is producing more and better quality food. And we can see a role for business, uh, not as philanthropy and, and, and so on, not as corporate social responsibility, but actually as business, uh, making money out of meeting these needs, provided that the policy frameworks are right, that the public investments are there to support it, and that the right incentives are in place to help invent industries uh, grow. Some of those businesses are international, some of them are local. Um, and sometimes the most interesting questions are about the relationship between the large multinationals on the one hand and the local entrepreneurs on the other. So is that convincing? That's the question for you for the next 40 minutes or so. That sounds pretty convincing as a first pitch. So let's try and see what we need to do to make it work. Let's see what's right with it and what's wrong with it. And let's challenge uh, the narrative with which we've been presented. I'd like to hear a dozen people speak uh, for not more than a minute or two each. So here are the rules. Please stand up, say who you are, take a microphone. And I'd rather you didn't ask a question. You can ask a question if you want to, but I'd much rather you said something that would in challenge us and interest us uh, so that we have a conversation and not a Q&A session. And just remember that we're on video, so you can be as ruthless, as demanding, as aggressive as you like, and it will be remembered for all posterity. So that's fine. Uh, um, I've got a mic, but I guess there are some other mobile mics hanging around. Who'd like to go first? But we work in the business innovation facility with um, maybe up to 70, 80 businesses that have high social impact, and around 10 of them are dealing with some aspect of nutrition. So from my sort of un la lack of expert situation, I was just thinking about these 10 and thinking about the challenges they're facing and wondering how they fit into what you're saying. Some of them supply to UN agencies, you know, biscuits for feeding programs and so on. And the problem there is UN procurement is not really designed to help a business develop. UN procurement is designed to fill a, a very immediate um, volume order. 
but the businesses find it very hard to actually develop their business, know what's happening in the market, and invest. I wonder if there's potential to do anything about that. Um, certainly, I was really interested in what you said about the breastfeeding rules and how that's um, putting off investment in nutritious products for those that are over six months. We're definitely finding that is a barrier, and I don't know what the answer is there if you're saying businesses do need to invest in nutritious products for children over six months, but the policy environment is telling them to get out of the way. That's very challenging. Um, we have a company in Bangladesh that's trying to produce fish that is not full of chemicals to make it look beautiful, uh, quite harmful chemicals. But the problem there, it's only the richest consumers in the capital that can afford that fish. So there's another problem of consumer purchasing power for the more nutritious food that hasn't got the nutrients bred out of it or chemicalized out of it. Um, and the last one we have is um, a company in Malawi trying to process peanuts uh, and, of course, aflatoxin. And the whole issue of quality control there is proving enormous. So we're ending up with all the aflato high aflatoxin peanuts going into the domestic food chain and aflatoxin being a much bigger problem to deal with than I think they were expecting. So I don't have any answers, but I'm just sharing the problems that our companies are finding in meeting this agenda. Uh, Caroline, just before you sit down, thank you very much for those really practical issues. Uh, these are indigenous companies rather than multinationals, I guess. Is there a sort of set of generic problems facing new companies trying to enter this space who are not multinationals and don't have the R&D and business development capacity? Interesting. I, yeah, they are all domestic companies. Um, I don't think they are linking with multinational companies in what they're doing. I don't think they would see themselves as in this space, part of your audience. They're individual ad hoc companies. We had another one that was going to develop nutritious baby food. They ended up not going off that way. But they're very individual. I don't think they're plugged in to these um, debates and policy contexts. So from their point of view, they're just business startups facing startup problems of governments and procurement and consumers and purchasing power. They, ha they haven't put it in that wider space. I think that's helpful because actually business development for nutrition is a special case of business development. And there are lots of issues we need to tackle there be even before we start talking about nutrition. Am I allowed to sit down? Yes, Brutner from BSF. Thanks for the opportunity to speak. I would like to place a question more in Garrett's direction, but that relates to finding common ground between the three approaches, which is one, the holistic agriculture, second, the thousand days, and thirdly, the large-scale programs. Um, we feel when we work with often local or regional companies that the whole areas of regulatory incentives is not really clear to them, so and disincentives. So if you start to fortify, first of all, what may I put on my package? Uh, so I'm adding an essential value added to the consumer. I would love to borrow my package as a messenger to the consumer. Um, who helps me other than the ingredient suppliers to uh, clarify what may I put in there? Um, what shows up at the package? Can I put better for your eyesight or better for your immune system uh, on, the, on the label claim? And there's very different policies in very different countries, not to mention the need of a logo. So if it's not a health claim, which is a text, uh, um, I think Gain did a great job in facilitating national fortification logos in the early stages of the program. Um, I think this part uh, also can receive some assistance from the community because it's uh, not rocket science, but there's some common wisdom with logos. Uh, simple, looks healthy, uh, easy to understand. So this whole package of regulatory incentives and disincentives and knowledge gaps, I think is something that should be taken into account. And, and regulation is needed because otherwise there isn't a market. Is that what you're saying? Well, you know, this is more the voluntary regulatory environment. So if I decide on a business case, what can I start with? And in particular, at the beginning of a program, whether it's a small, a targeted, or a nationwide one, you need some visibility for the nutrition value added. Later on, when it comes to a level playing field, I think this becomes more a regulatory, legal requirement, which has other implications. But I was more talking on the label claim, logo, incentive uh, part of it. I am Simon Bonnet from uh, Bell Group. Uh, so we are a cheese company, medium multinational uh, company, okay. Uh, we already uh, spoke uh, about that uh, with Marty uh, three weeks ago. Uh, most of uh, our products are consumed uh, by babies uh, after six months, uh, but they are nutritional design for adults. We would like to improve uh, the, the nutritional design of uh, our products to fit more with the uh, nutritional request of babies. 
But uh, when you say to the marketing teams that they would not be able to communicate on, on packaging or on add on so on, they told us just what for. So my big question is, in the next years, uh, will uh, it have really a change about uh, the policy of, uh, of uh, communicating uh, for baby food or com complementary uh, feeding? Um, I'd just like to go back to um, an Can earlier you say who point. You are? Oh, sorry. sorry, it's Taryn Barclay from Cargill. I just go back to an, an earlier point um, that I think was made about how you can also get that um, maybe that support to some of those local or domestic companies that are trying to tackle this issue. Um, Cargill is a partner in a uh, program called Partners in Food Solutions, which is actually a collaboration with DSM and General Mills and Cargill where employees are um, lending their skills and expertise to small and medium-sized food processors in developing countries. And it's a great opportunity for many of our employees to actually lend their skills and expertise in actually helping to tackle some of these issues locally. Well, we have a, obviously a very strong focus on food security as an organization, and um, we are going to be speaking a bit later around our Fortified Oils program in India. So. Um, that's a practical example of how we've actually used our business to tackle some of these issues. Okay, we might come back to you on some of the quality control issues. Let, let's pick up some of these as cross-cutting issues for a few minutes, if we may. And can I start with this question of uh, kick-starting indigenous engagement or even international engagement where there isn't a market? Um, is there anything about the nutrition market that is different to the market for you know, all the other things we talk about in the business and development community, and what are the sticking points that we have to overcome? Why don't I start with Mark and then work down, down the panel? Sure. Sorry, with Greg, sorry, Greg, not with yeah. Mark, sorry. No, no sorry, problem, sorry. Sean. No. <laughs> it's just, when there's such a dominant, a large Mark in the room, everything, you know, shades. Sorry, Greg. <laughs> not a problem. Um, no, I don't think so. I, I think um, any time we're talking about basic pyramid populations as consumers, you need to adjust your business accordingly. Um, and, I, and I'm thinking of all the literature that Unilever in, uh, in India has, has produced around this. But, but we've seen even um, on some gains programs some, some interesting ways of, of leveraging institutional demand to build the market for fortified products and, and, and other nutritious uh, foods. Um, in Nigeria, we worked with Tetra Pak um, to do an assessment of a micronutrient fortified beverage that was actually introduced into the school feeding program in one of the states. And although it doesn't continue in the school feeding program, it actually is now still on the market. And it was only because you had that institutional demand that was, that was available in the school feeding program. You have to be careful doing that, of course, because you know, in that particular context, you're talking about school children. and You, you want to make sure that you, you have an appropriate uh, product for them. But um, there, there's a number of case studies we're, we're developing at the moment which do exactly that, try to highlight what it is about uh, government programs, school feeding programs that businesses can tap into, utilize that demand, and then build on it so that they can take a product uh, nationwide, scale it up, and, and eventually make a profit while still providing impact and, and, and making a difference. Tell, tell us, for example, about salt fortification. I mean, I have no sense, really, of who produces salt in the range of countries we're talking about. Is it large producers, small producers, urban, rural? seaside, you know, mountains, and how do you then deal with the problem of developing fortification businesses across that range of companies? Sure. Well, the 73% worldwide coverage, I think, is where we're at at the moment. Um, you know, that's a great success, but that's among large and medium-scale producers. The last mile that we often talk about is the, the smaller scale. And so when we're talking about a Ghana or a Senegal, uh, Bangladesh, we're sometimes talking about 1,000 salt farmers, often along the coast with small salt pans, you know, drying out salt, and how do you actually effectively um, address that? Now, we've tried um, somewhat successfully, although the, the return on investment or the initial startup costs to do this are, are still in question, but in Ghana and the Philippines, we've started salt bank cooperatives. So the idea is basically let's take all the different salt farmers, put them in a cooperative, give them some startup capital, some technology, salt iodization machine, premix, train them on financial management, establish a board, governance, training, et cetera, and see how it rolls out. In the Philippines, it's working. In Ghana, it was a little less successful. But I think these are some of the models we need to try to, to reach those small-scale producers. Um, 
and this is going to be done by government agencies or by NGOs or by some kind of public-private thing or what? Uh, government would be great, but I, I think it would probably be NGOs that would, that would, that would kick-start this. No. Do you know, in, in some of the business and development meetings we have in London, um, in completely different fields, mining, Anglo-American, for example, who have a $15 billion supply chain, have a really important program which is designed to increase the scope for small medium enterprises to contribute to their supply chain. Mm. They deliberately unbundle the contracts, they have business development centers, they provide credit to small producers. Um, a lot of the salt, as you've said, is going into m food manufacture. Mm -hmm. So how do we then use that kind of example from the mining sector and translate it across to an issue like salt fortification? Yeah, I think economies of scale, um, general good business practice, I mean, all of these come into play. You have to keep the cost limits of iodized salt within reason. Um, two to three percent, I'd say, you know, you don't want to go too, too much higher than that, although in some countries people can afford it. But the, w what you said earlier, how do you ensure that those who need it are getting it? And I think that's, that's what we're, tr we're trying to, to aim at as we set up these cooperatives and different business structures, is to make sure that at the end of the day, it's not a luxury product. You know, mm. and it's still, they're able to turn a profit while still uh, reaching the basic pyramid. Are population. there any food companies in the room who have any experience they'd like to share on how do you engage small, medium enterprises in your supply chain? Hold that as a question then, and we might come back to it later and try and find some good examples. Mm -hmm. Caroline, are you waving? Yes. <laughs> water filters, I've been quite struck, and I'm quite struck by the silence today so far that Simon is encountering. Is there a real willingness to share experiences and models, because the sector will really struggle if there isn't? Sorry if that's uh, coming We'll leave that hanging, but it's the sort of role that GAIN can, can help with, and people like Business Fights Poverty, to find the good cases and celebrate them, because that is what is going to encourage best practice. Um, I want to come to you, Marty, and on this question of um, helping businesses to develop in the, in, the, in the sort of food area, providing the right kinds of foods. We've seen tremendous engagement by companies, uh, and actually Paul Polman's Unilever, he's speaking tonight, I think, around post-disaster foods. I was in Davos just after um, Haiti, and there was a huge outpouring of interest from companies in how do we find the foods that, you know, typically when there's a disaster in a rural area, you've got access to wood and water and you can, you can give people a sack of grain and they will be able to cook it. In Haiti, it was an urban disaster. We're going to see more of those. People didn't have cooking fuel and they didn't have water. So the rush was on to find ready-to-eat meals around the world and, of course, WFP with clumpy nuts and so on. An interesting point was made that there are surges of demand for these products at times of emergencies and then it kind of drops again. So what we want to try and do is create a sustainable industry. How do we do that? Mm, yeah. um, if only I had uh, the answer to your question, but I do believe that um, um, what we have seen as well also in the, in the infant food part is that we need to get a business model where um, a business can end um, supply for the institutional market for those surges of demand that you see in emergencies, but also then very slowly start up building their retail market. Um, and there are some um, companies that are trying to build out that model, but the issue, as Caroline mentioned, is that the procurement rules of the UN are pretty difficult. So if a company starts building up this, this whole production facility for emergency or for particular products, um, there will not be, I mean, it's, it's just not possible to get a commitment out of one of those big UN agencies up front because, because of their procurement roles. So on the one hand, we want to have the balance between the institutional and the retail market so that the risk of going into the retail market is maybe um, a little bit um, reduced. But on the other hand, the institutional market itself is very, um, very volatile, is, is something we cannot really um, relate on. In, in the infant feeding, I mean, one of the questions you asked um, also to Greg is about how do you work with small, medium enterprises? And so um, that is where we started, in infant foods. Um, but but the, the big problem is you start with s small local companies. Basically, you need to invest in every little step across their value chain, from the production capacity to the quality assurance, to the distribution, the marketing sales, the promotion. 
everything. And that is an enormous investment. And so how now do we, how can we scale that up? How do we get the interest? And especially for gain, it's really about, is that the way we're going? Or are we working with a little bit larger scale companies that need only more a catalytic investment because they've got their strength already across this value chain, but we can help them with the enabling environment maybe a bit more, the policy environment. Just, you said we have to reduce the risk for, for, for producers entering the market. How do we do that? Um, by, by creating that enabling um, environment, I think. If we, if we were talking about the policies, a lot of the policies are, are put in place to regulate and make sure that um, companies, sorry to say, but they do not do any harm. So it's really inhibiting, prohibiting any um, inappropriate marketing, any inappropriate um, product um, promotion. Um, I personally believe that we should look much more into a balanced approach where policies also encourage appropriate behavior, appropriate marketing. Um, and, and the only way to do that, I believe, is by keeping up this dialogue open with the policy makers. And GAIN can play a role in that, but I think private sector should also um, um, take up its responsibility and, and 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 be part of that dialogue. We have to bring scientists in, we have to bring NGOs in, but we have to actually educate the policy makers on what the result of their policies is. We also have to avoid making unrealistic demands of relatively weak developing country governments for high levels of regulation, which they can write into law, but may not be able to deliver on the to, And to enforce the law, yeah, yeah. absolutely. Yeah. Can I just say to you, I mean, our health colleagues solve this problem partly through advanced market commitments. You know, you develop a rotavirus vaccine and we guarantee we will buy it. And that reduced the risk for companies in their R&D and development mm. uh, uh, exercises. Should we do that? Why doesn't GAIN say to the world, we will put $500 million into buying, you know, clumpy nut if you, deliver, if you develop it? Is that the kind of thing that would help break this constraint on the production side? Um, well, I mean, the specific example of plumpy nuts, I, I, I do not want to touch maybe, but um, there, um, because there are some issues in yeah, the yeah, whole but, but uh, public health world about using plumpy nuts as a ready to use therapeutic food. Um, I'm not sure if that would help, yes or no, um, but it's, it's one of the things that we're looking into in saying, um, and as also I think in, in, it's about the stock, it's about um, really how do you manage um, that storage. Um, but then again, on the other hand, this is about emergencies, right? Rotavirus vaccine, I think it's, it's more on a continuous basis. So all this, this health, the medication is more needs on a continuous basis and for emergencies, um, maybe less continuous basis. So I think that... Um, that I was thinking that the emergency could, to, shade to into, into. could shade into long term. Uh, the emergency gives you an open door out of which you can develop a market, possibly. Um, possibly, yeah. Not sure that public health will, or public sector would like to open that door, by the way. But um. okay, we might. And I'll ask you in a second whether you have any views on advanced market commitments or other ways to kind of take things um, forward. Uh, Bonnie, this thing about how do we develop food businesses out of agriculture? What's been really interesting is to see the way that 20 years ago we used to talk about the self-sufficient small farm. IFAD, for example, the International Fund for Agricultural Development, has had a huge sea change in the way it now talks about developing small-scale commercial agriculture. So I guess the, 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 the parallel challenge to the small-medium enterprise in the food manufacturing sector is how do we help farmers to cross the barrier to become uh, commercial producers? Yeah, I think um, where agriculture is finally going is saying that agriculture is an industry. And until we position agriculture, not as livelihoods and development, but these are industries. These are farmers are private sector. Their incentives are to get things to market and keep their costs down. So we need to really think about farmers not in a romantic sense. Um, I do want to, if you don't mind, go back to this question of not only agriculturalists and farmers and bringing commodities to market, but the need to develop food, nutritious food industry. Um, and sometimes that is for diversified diets. That's bringing eggs to the people who need it. Um, that's bringing amaranth and more nutritious. That's Africa leafy greens in a form that can be affordable for the poor. Um, and I'm gonna take the opportunity to talk about this marketplace for nutritious food, which we're about to launch. Um, 
it, it was very clear to gain as we were, were moving around the world that it was precisely what Caroline was talking about. There were a lot of ideas out there um, with very little um, support as a community of small and medium scale enterprises that need to interact with policy, that, that among themselves could be sharing information. So we've developed this concept of the marketplace for nutritious foods. In the center of that community of practice is an engine which actually funds some of these great ideas to move toward marketable business plans. So what we do is we will provide, we will screen concepts, we review them for nutrition validity, we review them for risk, we review them as businesses, and we will provide small grants to allow those businesses to move to the next stage. Now some of those will go to scale, some of them are just taking an idea to a concept, a concept to validation, a validation to scale, it's the whole continuum. But clearly there's a need to catalyze some of these small and medium scale industries that want to bring nutritious foods to market. So we're launching that in Kenya, we're launching that in Tanzania, and we're launching that in Mozambique. Um, so you stay tuned and I'll be able to report on their success okay. uh, a year from now. Very good. Um, I think we're going to move on from talking about how do we get small businesses and large businesses in engaged in this sector. Uh, but I want to give a last word to anybody from the floor to come in on that topic before we move on to something else. So if you're on that topic, yes, please. Thank you. Just so, talk, just talk. Oh, thank work. you. My name is Wilbert Lodi. I come from Tanzania. I work for the government. I want to thank you for inviting me to the forum. I think this area is very interesting and very challenging. I've been working for the past 30 years in the field of nutrition, in Tanzania in particular. When you talk about fortification, when 80% of the children, those who are already stunted, are in the rural setting, in the rural areas, they don't go to the market. The 30% who are in the urban setting, yes, some of them can, uh, can afford, some can't. So what are we doing in Tanzania? We most welcome the idea of fortification. Definitely it's cost effective compared to the supplementation process. However, when you talk about the rural challenges we have at the rural setting, there are so myriads of many, many of the thousands of small meals, because uh, hammer meals, because many people there are eating maize flour, maize flour based foods. So how do you fortify them? Do we have good dosifiers? At what point in time? So we are actually grappling on how we can support, because stunting is already, 42% of children in Tanzania are stunted. So when we are talking about 1,000 days, we should start from the mother. So when we talk about stunting, it started has already happened. So we can't really reflect, we can't reverse. So Mr. Chairman, I think we should really focus the maternal nutrition so that, so that stunting does not happen. And for those which are, where it has happened, I think we should focus where is the majority of the population of the children who are more affected, and those are in the rural area. How can we fortify the maize flour? Because mothers normally take five kilos of flour on the tall meals. How can you help? The other vehicle which we are looking for is cooking oil. Many of those, if you drive in Tanzania, you find along the roads, the mothers, people are selling the, the, the sunflower oil. And you can't fortify the sunflower as it is today because to fortify the sunflower oil, any oil which is prepared at the local level, you need to refine because of the oxidation issues. Now, a good refinery is not less than $100 million. And here you are talking about a very good vehicle. Mr. Chairman, I'm not bringing the solution, but I'm looking at you as business, business community. How can you come in? Let me pick the idea of iodine deficiency disorder. It has worked a bit in Tanzania, and because that's why we are very happy, the, the iodine, salt iodation has gone up to over 90%, which is very good. Initially, the government had to subsidize, but now we have got Alliance, so Association of, of Salt Miners. They have contributed their own money, they go out and buy their own potassium iodate. And that's very good, because we have built the capacity. So in the same token, I think we should look on how we can capacity build in partnership with the government. Okay. How we can support to prepare simple dosifiers which can work in the rural areas. And simple refineries where people can go and refine their oils on the toll system, 
where they can afford. Otherwise, we'll be playing with people who can afford, and they are only 30 percent. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Bye -bye. You know, uh, sometimes in England people say the weather's very bad, but the answer is always there's no bad weather. There's only the wrong clothing. So in in this case, there are there are problems. But we also have to find the solution. So I want to come just quickly. Um, to Greg on this question, it's really your 70%, 30% question. Most people in Tanzania, you know, live in rural areas, have small-scale milling of maize, small-scale purchases from small mills for oil. How difficult is it to fortify in those circumstances? And is the answer simply to spread the large scale out to the rural areas, or can we start with the small scale and deal with it at that end? Well, it's, a, it's a very real issue. <clears throat> um, I think large-scale food fortification works because of industrial concentration. You know, when you can work with the large scale, um, there's, there's, there's fewer industries that, that would require dose fires, training, and, and premix. So it is something we struggle with. It is that 70, 30, uh, at least for salt, for, for, for other vehicles, um, it actually can be more difficult. I think in Tanzania, wheat and maize, for example, are not highly consumed in the rural areas from industrial, from, from large industries. They might be consumed, but they're coming from the small scale. Um, I think biofortification eventually will, will help in this area because we're talking about small-scale farmers taking up those fortified seeds and, and planting those, uh, ho hopefully, in, in the future, fortified, uh, biofortified maize. I'm glad he brought up oil, uh, thank you, because I think oil is a, is, a, is a great opportunity for us. If we work with the net exporters of Indonesia and Malaysia that are exporting to Africa in very large quantities, this is a huge opportunity, and there's actually very few refineries in Africa that we would work with, um, or we could actually fortify it at the point of production in, in Malaysia and Indonesia. So there's, there's big opportunities there. But maybe to get to the rural before we have biofortified is, is also to work with public distribution systems like we're doing in India um, and Pakistan and a number of other countries to work with uh, food rations and things like this and to ensure that fortified products are part of those distribution systems so that they do reach the poorest of the poor in the rural areas. Fine, I want to spend the last few minutes on, on the bottom of the pyramid, but Bonnie, quickly, biofortification yeah. As in orange, whatever it is. Right. Rice, no, is not it? orange, just orange. So for those who aren't <laughs> familiar with biofortification, um, agricultural plant breeders are breeding nutrients into staple foods. And so far, um, uh, for conventional plant breeding, there are many crops that are about to go out into the market. There's a pro-vitamin A maize that's being released in Zambia that we'll be working with. There's a high iron pearl millet that's been released in India that we'll be working with Britannia Foods to try to bring in the product lines. Um, there are a host, there's a, 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 a wheat that's been developed behind zinc, a rice similarly, um, and these are all sort of ready to go. They've been transferred, they've been uh, developed in the labs, the international labs of the Consultative Group on International Agricultural Research. They've been transferred over to the national research systems in target countries. They've been bred for the environments of those countries, and they're now being released by the national research systems in formal varietal release. They're getting on the market. And GAIN, the role GAIN is playing, is as a catalyst to link those new agricultural commodities into the food system. And we're looking for opportunities to do that while bu building the evidence base that these can actually have an impact on human health. Um, it's, it's a very exciting um, development. Um, and, you know, this is, this is actually a place where you've got agriculture focusing on a nutritional outcome. Um, I mean, that, of course, is part of the answer to the question I now want to ask the three of you just to comment on briefly in the last six or seven minutes, which is about this question of the bottom of the pyramid. And in the UK debate, we get two views on the bottom of the pyramid. You know, one is, this is where there is both the need and a market. And so, of course, we're all disciples of bottom of the pyramid thinking and we can develop sustainable businesses at the bottom of the pyramid, which will also help meet people's needs. And on the other hand, an argument we've heard today, which is actually the people at the bottom of the pyramid don't have the purchasing power, and the kinds of strategies that are being developed are not going to reach the poorest people. And sometimes, actually, the other thing that's said is that the products which are designed for the bottom of the pyramid displace local production. You know, you produce millet beer, which is great, but perhaps you're displacing female-headed households, widows producing millet beer in the village. You produce small packets of soap, perhaps you displace local soap producers. So I suppose the, a question for you to, to answer for us as we think about how business can help deal with nutrition is, is it really bottom of the pyramid or is it second level of the pyramid that we should be looking at? Uh, why don't I start with you and then we'll ask the other two. Do you mind? With me? Yeah, yeah. sorry. Yeah. Um, if you're asking Bonnie, I think if you're talking rural areas, we probably talk more bottom of the pyramids. Um, 
if you're looking at urban areas, I think it's a little bit above, absolutely. Um, I think we're looking at, um, at those people that have very little maybe purchasing power. Um, in public health, they are looked upon as beneficiaries, but I do believe these people are consumers. They make choices and they do purchase products whatever product it is, but people do make a choice, either to make once a week, you know, or offer, um, offer a soft drink to their children because it makes people feel good as well. So I do believe that there is a market, but it's also about how do you position these products. And um, one thing that I learned when I, I spent some time in private sector the past or before joining GAIN is that basically nutrition doesn't sell. So maybe what we should learn from private sector is how do we sell? How do we sell this? And I, I want to reiterate the, the point of the uh, behavior change. I think that what we see in private sector is that creating demand for a product, um, the understanding of consumer insights, consumer beliefs, um, and how to use emotions to really create the want for a product, I think we should bring that much more into this whole public health um, approach to nutrition, instead of only looking at the needs of these um, bottom of the pyramid consumers. And, and just so I can understand how this would work in practice, how, how do you stop the baby milk campaigner types saying to you, you are commercializing a food system and putting people in the clutches of producers whose only interest is profit, and this is not going to be of benefit to them in the long run? Um, there, there is, if, I think that if you're talking about the baby milk and the under six year, we have a big um, dilemma because there is a, the standpoint of certain people that said these products simply should not exist, right? And there are companies that are building a market and a huge profit out of these companies. Now that is pretty incompatible. Um, um, but there are, and even I think the, 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 even the activist would um, realize that those products are of high quality and that there are circumstances where um, those products might help um, mothers out. And I think the only way forward, I do not have a solution between that dilemma, but the only way forward is to co keep continuing talking. We will not be able to stop globalization, right? We will not be able to stop consumers from making some choices because it's more convenient for them. We cannot keep them into um, Stone Age. Yeah. Um, that is something for debate later, I think. You know, you might, as a company, have a choice between producing a product which is basically not very good for you and is a waste of money, but it happens to have vitamin A in it, or something which is much better for you, which also has vitamin A in it, and you might make some choices at the margin about where you allocate your production and your advertising budget, for example. So, you know, there's some interesting questions about what kind of guidelines would be appropriate for taking forward work uh, in this area. Um, I want to give um, uh, Greg and then Bonnie a last word, really, on this issue. How do we reach the poorest and, and how do we differentiate and what kind of ethical standards should, should drive um, our work? Uh, Greg, will you go first? Sure. Yeah, I think the population-based interventions, um, I'll let Bonnie speak about biofortification, but large-scale fortification of, of condiments and staples is an effective intervention because theoretically it's supposed to be reaching those in, uh, that are basic pyramid consumers. Um, now, I think that large-scale food fortification is not going to be the end all. It does not, it's not necessarily going to give a person 100% of all their micronutrient intake. Uh, it, it could in some situations. So it's, it's one of the layered interventions that needs to be applied. It's very cost effective, makes a lot of sense to do, and I think that's why countries are really lining up and rolling this out, not just for salt, which has been around for, for many years, but we're, we're seeing wheat really take off, oil fortification as well, and in, in other countries, soy sauce and, and, and other condiments. So I think it does make a lot of sense. It goes also back to Andreas's point um, uh, about uh, labeling. I think um, this is a learning area for us. Um, if we look at what Morton you know, did in the uh, 20s, 30s, and really up to the present day with the label. They didn't just say, is it iodized? They said it contains an essential micronutrient, iodine. And actually studies have shown that this has helped educate people about essential micronutrients in the U.S. And I think this is what we need to do with our labeling as well. It is aspirational, as, as Marty was saying. People, basic pyramid, are paying attention to what they eat. And I think if they see logos and labels and, and, and appropriate messages, it's actually going to increase demand over time and, and, and create the market that businesses are looking for. Very good, thanks. Bonnie, last mm. word to you. So um, I think the, the, there's a fundamental question here, which is, again, getting back to who are the poor, what are they eating, and where are they sourcing those foods? 
When it comes to rural populations, of course, there's on-farm consumption. That can make up maybe 40% of the diet, and it's highly seasonal. So, um, you know, I'm a farmer. I harvest my beans. I keep enough for seed. I keep enough for my household before it would go ahead and, pair, you know, be taken up by weevils. And I sell the rest to the market. Then I go back to the market later when the price is high. So, so the, the poor in rural areas are using markets because of the seasonality of food. And I think it's very important to recognize that they are engaging in markets. They're also engaging in markets for inputs. So I think it's also really important to, to when farmers are producing nutritious foods, the lesson for nutrition has been, uh, you know, don't sell everything, eat it. Right, because the, the incentive for farmers is get it to market, we need income into the family. So, so we do in nutrition have a big role to play in integrating messages into, into the agricultural extension services for nutrition. Um, and, and we actually, again, have started to talk about um, the use, and this gets back to the milling question in Tanzania. You know, what touches the poor in rural areas? The mills. Where, where a farmer may not be going to public health centers, they're certainly going to mills. And if you look along the agricultural value chain, where can we start to integrate nutrition as a touch point for those rural communities? The mill is definitely one of those. So, um, so the, you know, the question being, you know, how do we reach? We need to look at how, how people are using markets, public distribution for the very poor, but the bottom of the pyramid, there, what is the bottom of the pyramid? There's the dollar a day, there's the three dollar a day. And there is purchasing power, and people are making choices um, with those incomes. Okay, thank you very much, all three of you. Look, I think the risk here is um, that we make it sound very difficult uh, and very political because of campaigns about food and about the role of national versus international business and about whether we're really reaching the bottom of the pyramid. And those, none of those is a trivial problem, actually. And one of the reasons we're here today is to understand those problems and avoid being really facile about it um, and, and to have a really serious grown-up discussion about how we get business involved in solving nutrition problems. But there is a risk we make it too complicated. And the thing we have to hang on to in this discussion, and that's why the examples you're going to bring are so important, it can be done. It can be done across this range of issues, fortification, foods for mothers and children, education, um, and biofortification. It can be done in ways which, A, are profitable for companies, B, help poor people, and three, are ethically defensible in public fora. So I think you've helped us a lot in bringing out those issues. Um, there have been some really good interventions from the floor, but I'd like to ask you to join me in thanking the panel for their leadership on this.